I'm Alexandra Kiszka Grados from uh, Institute of Legal Sciences of the Polish Academy of Sciences, and I will be talking today about the highly controversial issue of penalizing Holocaust denial from the European perspective. By European, I mean the perspective of all those European states which decided to penalize in their legislation's Holocaust denial. Um, I must admit that I feel it's not the wisest idea to talk about Holocaust denial one hour after Professor Dobrolip uh, said, but I will try I will try to do it in the best possible way. Um, incorporating Holocaust denial into the catalog of issues governed by legal regulations and in particular by criminal law uh, raises a number of understandable doubts. Because aside from the controversies related to the indisputable in this case, um, problems with the freedom of speech and restricting freedom of speech, there are also problems uh, with the form of legal regulations uh, which ban dissemination of negationist thesis, as well as with the effectiveness and consistency of their enforcement. Thus, every single court trial and sentence for a Holocaust denial in Europe has to raise a feeling of distrust and even objection in the United States. And therefore, the question whether and how to punish someone for Holocaust denial poses a specific challenge for all those European enthusiasts of the greatest possible freedom of speech, who at the same time see the need to resort to legal instruments um, in order to protect different values and the rights of others. The essential differences between uh, European and American understanding of the free speech doctrine make it hard in the First Amendment ambience to accept the restrictive way of dealing with negationist thesis in many, although not all, European legal orders. I will try today to introduce some of the arguments used in the European discourse on that difficult issue. In 1984, during a research seminar held at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Professor Israel Gutmann wondered uh, whether Holocaust denial was simply a short lived phenomenon or if it had a future and would have to be dealt with. And today, when the thesis of negationists are spreading all around the world, and the president of Iran um, raising Holocaust denial to the rank of state of the dream, openly claims that the Holocaust never took place and is a fiction made up by Jews, the answer to Professor Goodman's question is unfortunately straightforward. The danger stemming from dissemination of denial becomes even more apparent when one considers uh, the general level of knowledge uh, about the Second World War and the Holocaust in Europe. Of course, the society itself, the nation itself, and the level of its historical awareness has always been the best guarantors of preserving historical memory. If, however, as indicated by a poll held in 2004 in Great Britain, over 60% of the British population under 35 years old had never heard of the notion of final solution, and a year later, 30% of students surveyed in high schools in Brussels and Belgium are convinced that Oskar Schindler was one of Hitler's advisors. We can see how much opportunity exists for those who wish to distort and mispresent historical truth. Internet makes it obviously uh, much easier, what is best proven by thousands of websites which furnish information about the quotation great Jewish lie in a way which makes them appear reliable, scientifically proven facts. Obviously, the low level of society's knowledge about the Shoah uh, or the lack of the appropriate um, response to its negation are not in themselves a sufficient justification for punishing for Holocaust denial. Also, the postulate of penalization of denial should not steal solely from the fact that the claim of negation is evoke moral objection. What are then the reasons? Uh, to recognize the legitimacy of the punishment for awards in case of Holocaust denial. The grounds for such legitimacy, identified by the legislators of particular European states, as well as by the European Union Con Con Council of the European Union, uh, in its common framework decision on combating certain forms and expressions of racism and xenophobia by means of criminal law from 2008, which in Article 1, Section D, places the European Union's member states under obligation to use necessary means to ensure penalization uh, of, among other crimes, um, the crime of Holocaust, are the following. First, the need to turn the memory and honor of the victims of the Shoah into a legally protected value. 
Secondly, the conviction that restricting the negationist freedom of speech is acceptable in order to protect a crucially important element of a national identity and in broader context of the identity of the entire European civilization. And thirdly, the recognition of negating the Shoah as one of the modern forms of anti-Semitism as a kind of hatred speech addressed to Jewish people, the consequences of which may lead not only to rise of anti-Semitic moods and attitudes, but also to acts of violence committed on that ground. Such prerequisites of more universal and axiological character are a kind of an attempt to formulate the justification for introducing legal ban uh, on propagating Holocaust denial. They indicate the legislator's rationale for using penal sanctions against negations. Let me now briefly refer to all three of them. First, the memory and honor of the victim prerequisite was particularly strongly stressed in the case of Germany, where inflicting punishment for dissemination of Holocaust denial is possible, among other legal methods, on the basis of regulations which prohibit insulting and humiliating the dead. However, adopting such an attitude uh, is tied with the risk of the negative effects of court trials of Holocaust deniers, because often they can turn into a kind of peculiar court show during which deniers get a chance to present their thesis in front of a wider audience, which may be seen as an additional insult to the memory of the murdered. However, the consequences of accepting this kind of presumption may be the assertion that actually nobody who tries to prove the legitimacy of his illegal actions in the courtroom should be punished, as it could simultaneously encourage others to take similar actions or insult the feelings of those who are the victims of such actions. Moreover, and for me personally, the moment when David Irving, a notorious Holocaust denier, denounces, even if only for a short while, in front of an Austrian judge, and loudly admits that the Holocaust was indeed a crime of Nazi Germany, and gas chambers were really used to kill people, Jewish people, ridiculous the whole negation movement, and proves how weak the basis of its ideology is. The essence of the second argument listed, related to the preservation of historical heritage, is captured well in the words of Professor Marek Safian, Polish judge of the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg, which were also spoken in the context of discussion on penalization of Holocaust denial in Poland. I quote, human memory is short and deceptive, while the trivialization of lies and hatred disseminated in public space may have shocking and destructive effect, particularly for the young generation of Europeans, end of quotation. Therefore, punishing negationists in this context is also aimed at impending the process of the gradual fading away of the memory of the Shoah and the essence of the totalitarian regimes which, after all, are not irrevocably by now. This argument emphasizes also the educational role of law and of the state, which through the introduction of the kind of taboo uh, protected by law, fulfills the, fulfills the task of affirming certain values, such as commitment uh, to the rule of non-discrimination on the grounds of national, racial, ethnic origin. And when it comes to the third argument concerning hate speech and hate crime, while most often the statements negating the Holocaust do not translate um, into a hostile, hateful, anti-Semitic references, um, the anti-Semitic motives of disseminating such messages become obvious uh, for anybody, I think, who analyzes them in a broader context. Negating the crime of the Holocaust has been described as a manifestation of anti-Semitism, among other documents, in the European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance Recommendation Number 9 and in the document entitled Working Definition of Anti-Semitism prepared by the experts of the European Union Agency uh, on Fundamental Rights, as well as in a number of resolutions of the European Parliament. Therefore, if we assume that Holocaust denial is a form of spreading hatred towards Jewish people, a manifestation of anti-Semitism, the legal regulations which would ban its dissemination could be seen as a broader strategy of the state which intends to fight all forms of racial, national or religious hatred and intolerance. And almost all European states have undertaken an effort in that respect, also in the legal sphere, in a number of international treaties. Of course, it could be argued that Holocaust denial um, does not translate into sudden intense explosion.
explosions of anti-Semitic moods, nor does it directly lead to acts of violence on that, on, on that ground. Uh, however, the fact that there is a strong correlation between words and actions is indisputable, although it is difficult to determine the exact moment of moving from words to actions. Uh, various forms of antagonism may lay dormant for long periods of time, only to suddenly begin to escalate, reaching the proportion of mass psychosis. A dramatic example of this was the radio broadcast air on the Rwandan radio station by a Belgian journalist, recognized by the International Criminal Court for Rwanda as incitement to genocide, and resulting in the journalist himself being found guilty of a crime against humanity. Those three main prerequisites are clearly mirrored in the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, the supervisory body of the European system of human rights protection. The court has repeatedly been faced with the problem of evaluating the way of using by the Council of Europe's member states their legal regulations limiting the freedom of speech of Holocaust deniers. In regard to the Strasbourg Court, um, there is a consistent and unambiguous standpoint in cases where an individual complaint concerns the limitation of freedom of speech of persons disseminating Holocaust denial. All such complaints have been so far recognized as inadmissible. The European Court's explanation of its position, such position, goes twofold. First, the court may consider uh, the member states' legal limitation of Holocaust deniers' guilt. Sorry, of Holocaust deniers' free speech to be measures necessary in a democratic society for the protection of the rights of others, for the protection of public uh, security and public morals, within the meaning of Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights, guaranteeing freedom of expression. In another option, uh, the European Court may refer to Article 17 of the Convention, which denies persons the right to engage in any kind of activity aimed at the destruction of any of the rights and freedoms set forth in the Convention. As a result, Article 10, guaranteeing freedom of speech, cannot be invoked and used by Holocaust deniers in a manner which conflicts with Article 17. Among other complaints of Holocaust deniers submitted to Strasbourg was that of Roger Gorodi, one of the key leaders of the negationist movement in Europe, who had been fined for denying uh, the crime of Holocaust by French courts. The European Court's standpoint um, regarding the attempts to use the Convention by the persons who disseminate the denial was presented here in a very decisive way. The European Court stated that negation of the Holocaust is, I quote, one of the most serious forms of racial defamation of Jewish people and of incitement to hatred of them. The denial or rewriting of this type of historical fact undermines the values on which the fight against racism and anti-Semitism are based. Such acts are incompatible with democracy and human rights because they infringe the rights of others. Uh, and quotation. As a result, the complaint was found inadmissible on the basis of Article 17 of the Convention. Some conclusions. The question of the legitimacy of penalizing Holocaust denial is an element of a broader doctrinal dispute where the views of those who uh, advocate the unrestricted freedom of speech uh, of the negationists clash with the views of those who see the need to use a specific legal barrier in cases of abuse of this freedom. The discussion on, the, on that is also constantly present among many uh, European states. For example, in 2007, the Constitutional Court of Spain found the legal provisions penalizing negation of Holocaust unconstitutional. It stated that the danger of restricting the free public debate within the democratic society of Spain overrides the need to counteract dissemination of Holocaust denial. The fact that serious doubts are rising among European legislators and courts is caused also by another phenomenon of multiplication in many states of so-called laws of memory. Recently, there have been more and more legal regulations penalizing various historical lies, some being far from rational. Two significant examples. In the Turkish Penal Code, it is forbidden to publicly claim that the genocide of Kurds had ever taken place. The world-famous uh, Turkish writer and Nobel Prize winner Orhan Pamuk was prosecuted in 2005, being accused of a public insult of the Turkishness, as he had stated in one of the press interviews that murdering Kurds by the Turks 
was nothing but genocide. And grotesque as it may sound, uh, at the same time, France and Switzerland penalized public denial of the, of the gen genocide of the Kurdish people. And simultaneously, the Russian parliament started preparing a new law uh, forbidding any critique of the role of the Soviets in the Second World War, which is a series of views of the truth from, from the Polish perspective. Uh, thus, it's clear that legal regulations on penalizing denial, a uh, Holocaust denial, can be used by the legislators as a precedent and a kind of an excuse, justification, for introducing new memory laws which sharply limit the scope of, the scope of freedom of speech. Uh, obviously, the problem of penalization of Holocaust denial does not only come down to indicating to indicating arguments for and against such method of dealing with this negative phenomenon. The very shape of the particular legal regulation, including the form and scope of penal sanction and the manner of using it by the courts, by national courts, is equally important and again at the same time controversial because these elements most often decide on crossing the thin line between justified restriction of freedom of speech and excessive legal repression, uh, which limits that freedom in an unjustified way. Thank you for your attention. Uh, the Holocaust 
assemblage ahead. Um, it's the uh, annihilation centers, annihilation camps Auschwitz. It's actually 30 miles away from my, where I live and teach. And there's still anti Semitism in the place where I live and teach. Reportedly, it's pretty high. Um, Yitzhak Shamir, uh, when he was Prime Minister of Israel, once said that all Poles had sucked anti Semitism for the Malas. Now, <laughs> now, if we uh, exclude those who were not breastfed, <laughs> <laughs> This is a pretty large estimation. Um, well, if we take uh, other estimates, it's still pretty high. The Anti-Defamation League surveys anti-Semitic attitudes worldwide. And that's the results of a survey which they did uh, a year ago. Uh, I don't have the time to discuss all the results, just one question which measures uh, anti-Semitic attitudes. Uh, whether this is true or not, respondents uh, uh, are um, asked to say, and that's the results from around, from several countries of Europe. Here we have Poland with 55%, more than half of Poland's adult population, which believes that this anti-Semitic statement is true. And there is no consolation that there are worse than us, like Hungarians or Spaniards. Uh, it's pretty high. Now, is this really so high? Um, I was trying to establish this, uh, and then I was going to uh, um, find out who the Antisemites are. Um, then I was going to uh, analyze how the Antisemitic views relate one to another, and I was going to compare my this year's data with some previous results. And that was the uh, uh, quantitative part of my project which I carried out through the means of a survey. But I uh, decided also to go deeper into, into the problem uh, through uh, some qualitative uh, research, through the means of uh, focus group interviews, uh, which uh, have the aim to determine what anti-Semitism means or what anti-Semitism is, if there are more than one meaning. And to reveal the structure of uh, the anti Semitic opinions. Uh, my project uh, has been part of a larger project, that's the title. I've been uh, involved in Auschwitz, research, in Auschwitz research for many years, and that's a continuation of this project, generously sponsored by the Polish government, the Ministry of Science and Higher Education, and I don't put it in number. Now, my uh, uh, theoretical um, um, assumptions were that we've got a variety of anti-Semitism and while trying to survey it, one has to define uh, uh, the categories. So there is modern anti-Semitism uh, and there is religious anti-Semitism and there is, or traditionally preferred, and there is what I called post-Holocaust anti-Semitism, which uh, has not been surveyed before in um, my country. And there is, of course, new anti-Semitism. I've said there's been uh, some research projects in Poland which have dealt with this problem. Uh, apart from the ADL surveys, um, there have been um, uh, quite substantial projects by Polish sociologists. Uh, Helena Datner is a woman sociologist from the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw, and she and uh, Irena Muszczelinski, a professor of sociology from the uh, uh, University of Warsaw, started a launched a major project in 1992, which Datner repeated partly in 1996, and then Muszczelinski carried out a new wave of this survey in Poland and the Ukraine in 2002. And I was using their approach a lot because I was going to uh, compare today's uh, attitudes or opinions with the past. And for this we need to ask exactly the same questions in the same way as the publications of the Chinese Now what the questions, what, what sort of questions do you ask the people? 
for modern anti-Semitism, uh, this is the question. Do you agree with the statement that Jews in our country have too much influence on A, political life, B, economic life, C, the media? And there was another question. Do you agree with the opinion that Jews have too much influence in the world? Just generally, too much influence. This gives us four items which are the basis for the assessment of anti-Semitism of its modern variety related to modernity in life. Okay. Then there is religious anti-Semitism. You can ask uh, various questions. I decided to take one from the previous surveys. Sometimes one hears the opinion that Jews have so many troubles because God punished them for the cru crucifixion of Christ. Do you agree with this opinion or not? And then I designed a, a question which was meant to measure uh, what, what I call post-Holocaust anti-Semitism. One hears sometimes an opinion that it is true that the Holocaust, the annihilation of Jews, was a major crime. But it is good that in its effect there are hardly any Jews in Poland. Do you agree or disagree with this opinion? And uh, to all of those questions, people were asked to give um, one answer from this variety, which then you combine in your analysis into the yes answer, positive answers, and the no answer, the negative answers. Well, all surveys have got limitations. Uh, we must realize what I'm going to show to you as results are opinions, not attitudes. The ADL reports are called anti-Semitic attitudes in Europe. And this is a little old. You measure just one part of what attitudes are. Attitudes are composed of opinions and other things. So I was surveying opinions. Then uh, questions may inform opinion. <coughs> When a respondent hears a question, he may actually start having an opinion on this question while the question is asked, not before him. And the style the question is asked is also informing people's opinion. Then there is, some respondents want to be polite to you. They like to tell you what you want. So if you ask a question in a certain way, you may actually get the, the, the wrong answer. And then there is political correctness and incorrectness. In some circles, it's politically incorrect to speak against the Jews. And people would say, difficult to say. Right? In other circles, it's politically correct, to, or whatever we say, incorrect, right? to, to criticize the Jews. And they would go on, irrespective of the wrong kind of thing. And of course, we are on our time survey all the time, so my respondents are. This is some facts about my survey. Field work was done in January. Uh, it was carried out by a reputable Polish poster, OLOP, which is part of uh, the Tyler Nurses Software Network, Global Network. They carried out face-to-face -face interviews in respondents' homes. This is how they still do it in Poland, following George Gallup, you know, the original. <coughs> how they ever we do it in um, the sample was 1001, and people aged over 15, um, which gives us this sort of uh, statistical limitation. So if the result is 95%, this means that statistically the error is plus minus 3. Right? If this is 5%, that's also plus minus 3. If, if this is 50%, the error is larger. Right? The closer to half you go, the, the more error, erroneous you are. That's the result. Now, <coughs> what we have here is the, uh, depends how you start, right? I would start positively. Yeah. Right? The majorities of respondents were negative about all anti-Semitic statements. Can you see it? Either absolute majorities, 
7 out of 10 rejected the uh, post holocaust and the views, or religious 65, or relative majorities 45, 43, and 33 percent rejected the uh, uh, the other kinds of anti-Semitism, except for the, what I call the international anti-Semitism. The belief in Jews being too influential in the world in Poland is over. Right? It's 45 against 30 percent. Now, you can of course do all sorts of statistical analysis with this, with this data, and this is what I'm going to show to you in a, in, in a few minutes. But let me first tell you who the Polish Antisemites are, according to the uh, values, demographic and social uh, questions which we asked in the survey. Uh, and that's what we expected. This is what, what the results confirmed. Gender does not correlate with antisemitism, except that men are more outspoken than women. You will hear more yes or no answers from men than from women. Women would be saying, don't know more frequently. Age, the elder the people, the more anti-Semitic. Well, this is interesting because when you compare this to the uh, uh, earlier data, 1992 data, the eldest respondents in the early 90s were far less anti-Semitic than, uh, than the average. Of course, there's been a 10-year generation shift. The eldest who remembered the Jews have passed away. So uh, those who are raised without the Jews, the elder they get, the more anti-Semitic they are. Education, the lower, the more religious anti-Semitism. Place of residence, the smaller size, the more religious anti-Semitism. Interest in politics, if people are more interested, they tend to be more anti-Semitic than average. If they perceive they are wealthy enough, they uh, tend to be less anti-Semitic than the average. And this is what we didn't expect, and what the results showed. Education. Among the people with higher education, there, were, there was a little more anti-Semites than on average. And so all the enlightenment theories, if you bring education people, sees believing in myths, is not fully confirmed with these results. Place of residence, uh, we expected the people, the smaller residents, the, the more understand political and international. This is not true. Big cities are stronger understanding than smaller locations. Regions, this is very complex. Um, roughly four regions in Poland. Former three partitions, Russian, Austrian, German, and the regained territories from Germany post war. The former German party, Prussian partition, and the regained territories, less understandable than average. Central Poland, former Russian partition, more, and Austrian on average, right? There's one exception, the uh, district of Lublin, and I have uh, some qualitative results to tell you about this, because I was so interested why Lublin stands out from the whole Russian partition. <coughs> political opinions, the less defined, the more understanding. Okay, now attitude to religion, this is interesting. Poland is 90 odd percent Catholic, according to self-identification, uh, and churches uh, data. They are practicing and non-practicing. Those who do not practice regularly tend to be less understanding than those who practice regularly. This is very interesting. Now, how many anti-Semitisms? This is a chart which shows the um, questions I ask. And they basically uh, uh, concern more than anti-Semitism, domestic or international, and historical anti-Semitism. These two, uh, the answers to these two questions are high, highly correlated. So are the answers to these questions. Right? So that's why I'm saying there are at least two anti-Semitisms in Poland the modern and historical, and of course all of them belong to the North John. Now, index. If you <coughs> combine uh, positive answers to four items, you 
you've got the index of unsigned. If you do, if you have uh, four items, if you have four answers, yes, you've got strong anti-Semitism. And then you go, no answers, yes, with no anti-Semitism. The same can be said about anti-Semitism, anti rejection of anti-Semitism. And now, this is the results in comparison. The 1992 results revealed almost 20%, 70% of strong anti-Semitism in Poland. Then 96, 24. 2002, even more. It was very, very, very troubling. My data show that anti-Semitism declined for the past eight years, but it's still, if you see it, it's still 20, 25%, one fourth, one fifth, one fourth of the countries. A dark population would be strong on the Semites. Quality. What do the anti Semites say? For this, I chose uh, to do group interviews with Catholics in three locations. And I did work with Poland Fielder myself with my students in June this year. And I will give you some updates. Who are Jews in our country? I was curious to know. If this question is asked. What, what those people would say? How big is the sample? The quality, yeah, the quality if you choose groups which would be of a small size, you are not interested in a large sample. I did three group interviews uh, between five and nine people each in order to you know, hear what they say rather than to count how many people say what. <coughs> yeah. The, yeah, yeah, no, the sample for the survey was 1,000. And that's the uh, qualitative part, which was which didn't have to, to regard the sound size. Mm -hmm. So the Jews in our country who got too much influence on politics and economy and the media are the Polish language politicians. Mm -hmm. They are Polish language Jews for all the country. That's the quotes. Um, Poles who have Jewish roots. Right? So they are singing the Polish, but in actual fact, that's my interpretation, they are Jewish. Whether this is true or not, they don't care. Right? This is what they believe. Who are the Jews in the world who got too much influence? The Jewish upper class, the oligarchs, not ordinary Jewish people. Right? And mind this, Jewish in banks, Jews in America. <laughs> right. Now the, the religious answer is in question. This is a quotation, a lengthy, a lengthy quotation, read it for yourselves. It's a very interesting mixture of religious traditional anti-Semitism and political international anti-Semitism. Right? So this is how the various kinds of anti-Semitism are related in individuals' minds. It's not very bad. But then you have, that was a whole group of Catholic uh, intelligentsia, the higher education people in Krakow. There's a club there, and, and they came all along. And when they heard this, they said, no, this is a heresy. Right? So even among the Catholics, you would see this, uh, as if these were two different denominations. Of is there a class difference at all? No, it's not. It's a, a region. Yeah. It may be also who supports Vatican II and who doesn't. Yeah. <coughs> Different, yeah. These were the people who are very much into the teaching of the Vatican. Mm -hmm. And these were the people who are the listeners of the Radio, Ma Radio Maria. Uh, mm -hmm. oh, right. Not the right-wing uh, extreme national Catholic. Mm -hmm. What is that region where that is red? Uh, red, red. This is... Uh, where is that? Red. This is Eastern Poland. Mm -hmm. Right? And this is uh, yeah, southern Rome. By the way, both is Galicia, the former Austrian partition, except that this is far stronger, this region, the Jesuit region, is far stronger than the This is one of the strongest in Poland than the Krakow region. Uh, 
the Holocaust and post-Holocaust anti-Semitism. This was universally rejected, and this is why. That's the quote from, from Josh that was quite optimistic and correct. And also they, they refer to the teachings of the John Paul II. But, right, at the same time, in the Jeshu group, in the Radio Maria group, you have this view uh, expressed in a different context. The English language translation does not render the uh, anti-Semitic flavor of this utterance. Mm -hmm. right? And you see, when I spoke with this, when I interacted with these people, they were nice. They were, you, you didn't, you wouldn't think they are bad, but at the same time, this is what they say. All right, conclusions. There is a fair amount of anti-Semitism, but less than commonly believed. Generally, two kinds: modern and historical. With modern being wider spread than the historical. Polish modern antisemitism is more global than local. It's like elsewhere in Europe or in America, even. Whereas uh, the historical antisemitism is probably like in Hungary or Slovakia or in uh, Ukraine, wherever uh, the Holocaust happened. Uh, it's more localized. <coughs> the question about whether, whether the, uh, the, the uh, post-Holocaust and the Seventh Amendment does not, would, wouldn't mean anything in, in a place like the UK. Maybe Belgium, because they were Jews of France, they were in Belgium or Paris in the Holocaust, but I don't know. I would have to ask this question then. New anti -Semitism. I didn't show you survey results for the new anti because there are any. Even ADL doesn't have a, a good question which would measure it. However, from the qualitative, I, I had the sense that there is a relative absence. However, there is some potential. And uh, I have to finish now, so thank you very much. Sorry. After, no, after the three speakers finish, yeah. we'll have a This is really the first track. Um, I'll begin uh, with uh, this, the, um, 
reference to the song Biachim Zolich Gain. It's a Yiddish song. It was written during the Holocaust era by uh, Y. Uh, Horn Tire, uh, a, Polish, uh, a Polish writer who was murdered in Auschwitz. And uh, the song begins, where, where shall I go? Who can tell me where? Uh, where shall I go uh, when there is no place for me? No one, all the doors are closed to me. And uh, I have the sense that our survivors are feeling that again, that that, that song is echoing again uh, as, um, as they remember the slogans they remember of the 1930s, Poland is for Poles, Jews, Jews to Palestine, have become Jews out of Palestine, and the uh, Helen Thomas uh, outburst, Helen Thomas, the White, the White House journalist, who said that uh, the Israelis should get the hell out of Palestine, and when, when asked where they should go, she said they should go back to Poland. As, as you know, assuming that all all the Jews came from Poland. Well, certainly, uh, the in my study, the Jews didn't all come from Poland. Uh, my study was very very select in that I I interviewed five survivors for this. Um, five of the survivors who are among our youngest survivors. They were children or teenagers during the Holocaust. All but one of them lost uh, lost uh, all. Only one of them lost every member of her family. All the others survived with some or all family members intact. Um, and um, they all, um, one doesn't call himself a survivor, calls himself an escapee or a refugee, but we use the Yad Vashem definition of, of a survivor, anyone who, who was in camps or, in, uh, or who fled from Nazi Europe. Um, uh, so uh, all all the the other four survivors were all helped by uh, by righteous rescuers. So that that uh, that group that subject group is very special in itself, and it doesn't and this paper doesn't purport to uh, to give a broad scope uh, the, the survey of of the reactions of survivors certainly the uh, older survivors certainly the survivors who survived as as complete orphans, uh, and certainly the survivors who met no, um, at least not face to face, any righteous rescuers. So, given that, um, I just uh, want to tell you that the, the, the hypothesis for the study was that living with the memory of the Holocaust and its prelude has made survivors keenly alert to current anti Semitic rhetoric and threats. Consequently, the effects of these threats have more, more pronounced uh, uh, impact on the survivors and, uh, than on Jews who have not experienced the Holocaust. Um, the method, as I, I mentioned, uh, was to draw uh, a series of questions. Uh, and I did this uh, with, uh, I chose my survivors. They all, they, this, the, the survivors I asked all responded that they wanted to be part of the uh, process. I actually emailed them because I didn't want them to feel compelled and I thought it would be easier to, uh, to refuse an email, but they all wanted to be part of, of this survey. Um, and um, the interviews were conducted one-on-one. -on -one. I, I videotaped them and um, also took notes as they spoke. I didn't interrupt them. I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, I didn't um, bring in any other issues that, than what they remembered. I wanted the responses, these responses for this particular survey to be immediate and visceral. Um, and I, I believe that uh, the, um, the value of this has, uh, is, is for part of understanding, a comprehensive understanding of the effect of the Holocaust on survivors. Um, more practical, uh, its value for uh, physicians and, and uh, mental health therapists, and uh, for me to share to, to share with people who are here and interested in, in hearing the results. So um, my uh, questions, uh, I, I I group my questions into into five uh, five topics. 
uh, their personal response to the new anti-Semitism, the survivor in the world, uh, Israel, their reactions to Israel, uh, after the Holocaust, in other words, the Holocaust's effect on, uh, on anti-Semitism, and uh, just a, a, look, a general looking back and going forward. Uh, I don't think I have the time to give you the histories of, of, uh, of my survivors. They're very, very interesting um, and unusual, um, as are all, are all the stories of survivors, but I think these are particularly so. And, but uh, if there's time at the end, we can, we can address that. Um, and so I do want to share uh, the conclusions which I think is, is what, uh, what, what interests you all here. So, um, under, under, the, um, under the survivors in the world, um, well, let me go back a little bit. Uh, most, of, most of the survivors, all of the survivors, do feel the threat. One of them said that he doesn't feel it as an immediate threat. But they all feel threatened by this. They were all made uneasy by this. Only one of the survivors uh, reported that he doesn't have uh, bad dreams or nightmares. All the others uh, do. Um, most ascribe the advance of the new anti-Semitism to, um, uh, to, uh, to extreme uh, to the Muslim extremists. Um, Two of the survivors, two Polish-born uh, survivors, mentioned the church. Uh, the others did not. And one survivor mentioned the economic uh, situation. Uh, the notion of history repeating itself was used over and over again by these survivors. They all, they all spoke of that. Um, so uh, on, on the subject of uh, survivors in the world, um, only one has not traveled uh, beyond, uh, beyond Poland, Germany, her, uh, her coming to the United States, and she has gone to Israel, but she hasn't visited other countries in the world. All the others are pretty well traveled um, in, uh, in Europe and in, uh, in South America, Australia, Asia, uh, uh, Africa. One, one has visited Africa, and one, one, uh, one actually trekked just a few years ago through Tibet. Mm -hmm. So uh, it gives you a sense of you know how vital these survivors actually are. Even the one, the one who is, who is, um, who is suffering uh, illnesses related to the Holocaust um, fights against that every day and uh, doesn't complain and just comes and does her work. So. Uh, this is a, a, a rare, rare group. Um, they all mentioned that uh, in traveling they did not encounter anti-Semitism. Um, in fact, one of them said that he encountered an more anti-Semitism um, in, in this country, uh, in, in his apartment building, and um, also when he was in the army, because he, uh, he, he this is my escapee, he is, um, I'll call him, uh, I'll call him, uh, Ed, um, he, he left Kristallnacht with his family, with his immediate family. A month, he left Germany a month before Kristallnacht, uh, finished high school here, went, to, uh, uh, went into the army, became one of the monuments men saving the art that the Nazis had appropriated, and um, uh, he, he trekked through Tibet just a couple of years ago. On the subject of Israel, all of them expressed admiration uh, for Israel. They also expressed some criticism of Israel, Israel, Israeli politics, uh, but really they were very reserved about it. Uh, it was, it was a, an attitude of um, uh, you, don't, you don't hit a, a, a man when he's down. Uh, so, uh, they, I asked them if uh, one of the questions was if they would feel comfortable if their children were to move to Israel. And all of them do have, all of them married, all of them do have children and grandchildren. Uh, and the response, uh, I found the response surprising. Only one was uncomfortable with that notion. Um, uh, one thought that, uh, that uh, 
they would be more secure in Israel than they are here um, because of Israel's security, not because uh, of the He's, 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 he's very right-wing, and he believes that Israelis know and do more about security than the United States does. So that was, that was the reason behind that. Um, two of them said they would follow uh, their children there. One did not. Uh, one would not follow, but he would not be upset if the children moved there. Um, after the Holocaust, None of the uh, interviewer, interviewees saw a, a direct trajectory between the Holocaust and the new anti-Semitism. However, they are sad and disappointed that the, that the Holocaust hasn't eradicated this hatred as they had hoped it would. Um, one of them uh, suggested that it was, uh, it was so contained, it seemed so contained in the 1950s and 60s uh, and uh, maybe early 70s, that its eventual demise seemed possible. Uh, he was the only one that mentioned that. Um, uh, Lena, uh, my, my Holocaust survivor, who was, um, who, was, who was the only one who suffered illness, uh, considers it possible that the Holocaust encouraged anti-Semitism because in Poland, it achieved the nationalistic aspiration voiced before the war. Poland is for Poles, just go to Palestine. She also stated, what happened can happen again. All voiced belief in the necessity of education, though not necessarily through museums and memorials, some of them they indicate, some of these in, they indicated may actually have a, a deleterious effect. With the exception uh, of uh, of one survivor, all believe that the long delay in delivering Holocaust education has had a bad, has had a negative effect, and has led to uh, the more recent genocides. Um, Ed wondered, Ed is my my Tibet trekker, wondered what the Holocaust can teach, but he answered his own question. He has witnessed the positive impact of Holocaust education on students and also adults. Furthermore, the recent return of some of the Nazi stolen art to Holocaust victims and their heirs has impressed him. Looking back going forward, most survivors cope with the new anti-Semitism by adopting a positive attitude, staying physically active, intellectually engaged, and socially involved. Lena, uh, and she, she was my post, the post of who suffers, is convinced that many of her ailments result from Holocaust-related injuries. She still has a bullet in her thigh, which she got when she jumped off a train. Um, uh, and, um, and the stress of coping with memories as well as the new anti-Semitism. Um, although she views the current socio-political and economic situation, uh, as 1930s redux, a vivid history of what I went through. Uh, Ed negates the uh, physical effects of his stress. He is determined to live to be 100 as one of his grandfathers did. Uh, all emphasize the importance of vigilance, of speaking out against anti-Semitism and other injustices, of interfaith dialogue and of educating people, particularly young people. Uh, and that goes back to what I originally said about the nine-year-old. The nine-year-old knew CPR, his mother did not. And when I heard that today, it, it reminded me of, 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 of how important they consider educating the young. Uh, none of the survivors I interviewed have given up on America as, as a secure sanctuary for Jews. Unlike, unlike an increasing number of European Jews, none of these survivors have bought a safe uh, sort of say contingency and bought a rented suitcase apartment in Israel. Um, is my time up? Yes. Yes. So thank you very much, and um, I'm happy to answer your questions. It was affordable and was largely designed for this, because we asked ourselves how did this transmission take place when it was in the country? It's not as official, not formal, not officially to do, you know, published. Is it published in Poland? And it is. Mm -hmm. And just the last week, there was an interesting item in the, in the uh, Polish and uh, the uh, Poland report on the spiral semitic trend. You didn't discuss it, the spiral semitic trend in Poland. This nostalgia for Jews, which minorities have, and so on. And if you 
uh, Parliament grammatical, the final sermon is meant to buildings and wrote, here live Jews. We are missing the Jews. Yeah. They were arrested by the police because the police thought that they were insulting the word jit as, a, as an insult, as a permission in Poland. So this paper uh, is, is extremely interesting because there's a Jewish conception which I myself, I'm a scholar of the profession, but I myself share that if I were to ask, if I were uh, spontaneously to say, where is the assembly most deeply rooted? It is Poland, it is uniform, it is universal, and what few accept. And there is a common belief which I, I should know better, instinctively have that, uh, that same. Uh, uh, that same attitude. What impressed me most was when we studied, first of all, the Holocaust, the political parties in Poland had all political parties except for the PPS, the PPR, and a small anarchist group had a provision that Jews should not be citizens of Poland after the war. When I read that, that I was shocked. Jews have been burned by millions. And the leading political parties in Poland, you can find that in the Riemann Bulls book, Poles the Jews during the war. It's translated, translated in the Greek. That was to me horrifying. That, by the way, the same was true of the, of the, in the Germany. All German political parties, with the exception of the communists and socialists, in the opposition to Hitler, did not want to grant the Jews full equal rights after the war. Of course, there was strong discrimination, but Jews should be a friend in the race, which means the uh, right of, of strangers that not be so. The other, I just want to read a few points because I have so many points, but that one is intellectuals and anti-Semitism. You'll find this in Russia as well. Uh, Orwell used to say there are certain absurdities which only have to be highly educated in the uh, And I become more and more convinced of this that I study German anti-Semitism. Uh, the idea, for instance, let's take a Nazi idea, which was, uh, which was sort of orthodox in Germany before, uh, under the Nazis. Every Jew is a criminal, is born criminal. The duty is to be born of the right. I, I tell the Christian, I discuss the German Christian, what I said, means God revealed himself on Mount Sotna to a gang of criminals. <laughs> now, the average German was more skeptical towards this. What is it? it doesn't make sense that every Jew is a born criminal. It just, it just makes no sense. But if you study something, something in German with a footnote, you now the German general flags before footnotes. The more footnotes the study has, the more persuasive it is. And if it has bears a patina of scholarship, it's very persuasive. Intellectuals were prepared to believe the most monstrous things which the average German was skeptical of because it made no sense for him. He didn't read any books. He had common experience. So you have the same thing uh, to some extent in Poland. They're not reading books, but they're more intellectually alert, searching for explanations for political events, and latch on to the Jews. But the, Pole, the average Pole has a sort of a visceral reaction rather than a sophisticated reaction that was capable of, of being receptive to these elaborate theories of the Jewish, the Jewish uh, in Russia, you have a different phenomenon. For instance, by the way, there's an interesting point that the Arab is very complex to figure it out. Mm -hmm. There's the whole region of Eastern Europe. The Arab Israeli conflict is not a factor in Hungary, certainly not in Russia. And what you have in Russia is a strong politicization. Is a weapon. It's a very complex and it's in a battle about the nature of Bolshevism, the nature of Russian, and so on. A complex, very complex battle. So there, the intellectuals are much more anti Semitic. Now, I was marching in a demonstration as a participant in Moscow in the 1990s, just to listen to this. And suddenly, I hear a cry. Uh, you know, probably a little bit of Russian, Smirk. You raised him in Kupanta, death of the Jewish occupiers. So I got, I was marching with them, and I got very shaken up by this. So they asked me, were you insulted by this? I said, yes. 
He said, well, questions about Jews, March. And then Banners of Lenin. And I asked, how dare you walk? And did you know what Lenin said about this? So they began to, they surrounded me. They were not hostile, they just tried to enlighten me. Why they shout, Smerth, Nimetz, Yerez, Yerukhanta. So these were all intellectuals, people who were educated to read and so on, and marched with the letter of demonstration. So these are the, just three remarks I, I want to make, but there's so many other remarks. I'm glad that you corrected the picture. Things are much more com complicated. And, uh, and above all, it's very important to know what are the chances of transmission. Where did all this come from? When it is, in Poland it was in the air in the two world wars. It was natural, Jewish, the Palestinian, and so on and so on. I'll just tell you, it might be short of interest if I can, a little bit of Persian, because I had some experience. I was born actually in Kumina. And at the end of the war, I passed through Poland and stayed for a short while in Bitol. Mm -hmm. And one night I was almost killed. I was at that time a, 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 a teenager. The NSZ, Nationalist is growing, they're called fascist groups, were killing at night communist Jews. Wherever you stop to stop people on the street, and Jews finally got, and they were killed. I remember a thousand Jews were talking about the war by these groups, by these enemies that they had. Mm -hmm. So I walked out with a friend of mine in Bethlehem. He walked in one direction, walked over from him in front of I in the other direction. He was stopped and he was killed. Mm -hmm. So I sense here in Poland there is this branch of Jewish blood, an organization is, is, is killing Jews after the war. So your paper is so interesting, and I have so many other clients, but I don't want to occupy this. I have a question for Professor Fulcher. Um, I'm interested in uh, the relationship between what you talked about and events of 1967. Um, wasn't there a state-sponsored or state-motivated campaign in Poland against the Jews? 68, okay. Um, and what was the population, Jewish population like before that campaign? What motivated it? Um, what was its, what do you think its effect was on Polish attitudes toward the Jews? And how many Jews actually emigrated at that time? That was a state or communist party sponsored um, wave of anti Semitism. And did it resonate in Polish society? Direct, yeah, yeah, to, to some degree, yes. It's hard to say to what, because it was a closed society, no mm -hmm. way of measuring public opinion service. Uh, and a lot of state-sponsored rallies, but from what we would now call qualitative, from the uh, uh, utterances recorded or diaries uh, from interviews which historians now do oral history interviews with the people who remember this period. There was a fair amount of support uh, of this anti Semitic campaign by the older people. That was the, that was the, which was basically targeted to the uh, remnants of the Jews of Poland the ones who were highly assimilated mm -hmm. uh, and many of them did not even mm -hmm. feel themselves Jewish mm -hmm. they called themselves Polish but they were remembered their Jewish origin and they were forced out of uh, the uh, party or state mm -hmm. positions and forced out of the country um, that's the, that was the last big wave of Jewish emigration from Poland after which there are hardly any people in Poland would consider themselves Jewish. I mean, the 1,000 plus figure from the last census, this is really minimal. By the way, in that census, uh, people could choose only one self-identification. Mm -hmm. right? So we, today's idea of multiple identities was not part of the methodology of the survey, of this sort of census, mm -hmm. which by the way is going to be repeated this year. Uh, um, sorry, yeah, this year. Um, again, without multiple choices possible. 
I would like to add to that that uh, one of uh, my survivors that I interviewed for this paper uh, was one of those Jews who, uh, who came to the United States after 1968. Um, and she came, uh, she came here because her son wanted to come here. She lived in Poland. She was a very famous uh, stage star in Poland. Um, and uh, they, she lived um, without referencing her Judaism at all. Mm -hmm. um, and um, her son uh, was not told that he was Jewish until he came home one day talking about some dirty Jews that he saw, mm -hmm. at which point uh, his parents uh, revealed that, they, that, he, that he was Jewish. At that point, he wanted to leave Poland because I think he, he felt threatened and, uh, and come to the United States. He's in the film industry, very successful. Um, and, um, but he doesn't consider himself Jewish mm -hmm. and doesn't live here as a Jew and is in his second marriage now. Uh, neither of, the, of, of his partners uh, were Jewish and the children are not raised, uh, his children are not raised as Jewish. But, but I'm just curious, to, this is probably an impossible question to answer, but what do you think your statistics would look like if you were to have done these surveys, say, in 68? If this was done in 68, after the, the uh, government-sponsored anti-Semitism, um, people would, would have said, Finally, there is not uh, too much influence of Jews in Poland, <laughs> right? Because they, 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 the the remnants uh, of Jews have been forced out of the um, influence positions. If this had been done in '67, perhaps the answers would not even be different to the ones which I've got, because I believe very few people in Poland. Um, would sense that those Jews who were forced out in 68 were Jewish. Mm -hmm. You know, much, de much depends, M much of those results depends uh, on how people feel um, they are prosperous. Uh, that was partly uh, discussed by me. I mean, uh, anti-Semitism, in my understanding of my data, is highly related to um, uh, to uh, the sort of bad feeling about myself, uh, that I'm not doing well enough, my frustrations, particularly the uh, financial situation. And then if I uh, try to find who's guilty, I'm having a ready-made uh, answer, which is part of culture. Uh, Jews are guilty, right? Can you well, mention the, the, uh, the statues uh, of the Jews? Uh, that are for sale in Poland. Yeah. Stereotypical. Well, that's that, that's one aspect. Of, anyway. yeah. yeah, that's another aspect of this story. But I was going to, to refer to, to the point which you raised in, in, in your comments about uh, the transmission through family. Um, it's it's very interesting uh, that you, you would it's social socialization as we call it in sociology and so, social psychology. It's very interesting because you don't have the same effect uh, of the family transmission in the areas where uh, there were many Jews before the war and where the population, had, the Polish indigenous population had not been moved, as opposed to the areas where there were not many Jews before the war and or the Polish population which is living there have been moved. I mean, uh, the, the extremes. Uh, the, uh, the region which I chose for my qualitative, the, uh, the, the Rzeszów region, the Radio Maria people, uh, this is a very st stable region in terms of population movements. People who are living there are from the generations the old, the, the, of established poles. There, there were uh, many Jews living in this area. Right? Uh, one of my maps was showing it. And then you I oppose this to the areas uh, close to today's uh, Germany's border, right? the western parts of Poland, which had been Germany before the war, uh, where the population, today's population, which is 
almost wholly Polish, was moved from uh, what used to be eastern parts of Poland before the war, which is now Ukraine or Belarus or Lithuania. But there were uh, many Jews in, right? And the, the, uh, the level of anti-Semitism in those two regions, today's eastern part of Rzeszów and today's western part, Jelona Góra, are proposing high in Rzeszów and low in, in, uh, in Germany. Now, both uh, people have got the transmission through family. Now, why is this transmission in the western region not having the effect of the same uh, amount of anti-Semitism as there is in Russia. This is the question I cannot answer. I was just giving these facts, you know, established Polish population, moved Polish population. Many Jews uh, living in the area, very few, hardly any living. And the remembrance of the Jews living in the uh, area of the forefathers of those people in Western Poland today. I mean, this is not working. So, uh, I, would, I would argue that uh, migrants, emigrants, would be less anti-Semitic than the settled people. Mm -hmm. This is my, my hypothesis. Um, yeah. What about the teaching of the, I mean, when we're talking about family, what about the teaching in schools? Yeah, that's another thing. Start from yeah, mm -hmm. yeah but I've got another chart, chart which I did not include in my presentation, which shows how low anti-Semitism is among this, the school, the school students, the uh, 12 to uh, 16 year olds whom I surveyed, um, uh, not as part of this project a few years ago, uh, and the, the level of anti-Semitism is minimal, it's 5%, so maybe, you know, it's not very... Is it taught at school, the whole class? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I would, uh, yes, and I would use this this data from the uh, youngsters survey as a proof for the effectiveness uh, of uh, uh, um, Holocaust education. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, if you have the uh, 2010 results compared to the uh, 2002 results, and then um, the, 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 there is a table which I did not include, which shows, you know, 10 years ago, um, no, I did 2005 I did a survey and the Holocaust education has been around for some 10 years at least. So for the past 10 years, yeah, I mean there has always been some Holocaust education but very, you know, very uh, uh, intense education has been around for 10 years. Now, why are those in their 20s more anti-Semitic now when they were not so anti-Semitic 10 years before? Um, and that's another hypothesis I've got. Uh, Anti-Semitism, as all other um, xenophobic attitudes, are related to age. The elder people become, the more xenophobic, i.e. anti-Semitic anti they become. And then if uh, the frustration from your life situation comes along, that's another factor which, which um, strengthens the possibility of anti-Semitism. And you have got this sort of various factors operating. So you may have a very uh, uh, well established Holocaust education, which would be effective short term, but then in 5 or 10 or 15 years, we don't have studies which would check this. But I would be very curious to repeat this study in 15 years or something and, and to check whether I'm right. You know, this is something which you cannot cope. Uh, with unless you uh, have what is very trendy in the EU, lifelong learning, right? That you do uh, Holocaust education not only in, these, in, in the school age, but throughout uh, your life. How do you do it? That's the matter for the uh, education system. How do you explain Lublin? Lublin. Lublin is a very interesting case where the church leader there, the Archbishop of Lublin, um, um, Father Rzeczyński is a very outspoken anti-anti-Semite. Mm -hmm. right? he's, he's rejecting anti-Semitism overtly. Mm -hmm. he's, no, he's even labeled Jew right? yeah. because of this. <laughs> That's another thing. Mm -hmm. you, you, you've got this label Jew. If, if, you, if you do too much anti-Semitism, 
anti antisemitism mm -hmm. you are Jewish, right? So he's a very outspoken, he's, he's, a, he's got a pretty high standard, he's a very clever man. He incorporated into the curriculum of the uh, um, uh, uh, priest seminary, the, high, the university for priests, um, uh, Judaism. And uh, I was taught uh, by my uh, respondents, in, by my informants in Lublin, uh, who worked with him, with, with Zuczynski, that uh, um, there is a so-called day of crying for all the um, uh, priest trainees that they have to go every year, there is a day established by the bishop uh, when the, uh, uh, the uh, priest trainees go to a Jewish cemetery in the area or to the place where there was a synagogue and they pray uh, on the song, they pray psalms, mm -hmm. right? And they cry for the Jews of the area, right? So that's the way of commemoration and um, kind of a religious ritual as well. At the same time though, when you uh, do uh, ethnographical studies of the locals, you would be you would be terrified at the amount of religious antisemitism, right? In, in the low, in, in, in the in the base, I mean, uh, uh, in, at the grassroots level, among the ordinary Catholics, uh, so you, you have a very you know good leader, which is speaking against antisemitism, political and religious, uh, who who, who uh, lets priests be trained so that they would not be antisemitic, and at the same time, uh, the people are still you know preserving those uh, superstitions. Which is um, which is such showing the the fact that even you know uh, um, if, if uh, the leaders of a church uh, would be combating antisemitism, it's not um, an imminent effect. It's not going to have an imminent effect among the ordinary believers. Maybe in some you know five or ten or fifteen or twenty five years. I think if you did a comparative study of antisemitism cross culturally, you would find that Poland is probably one of the very few. Which has a religion, uh, 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 the Christian source of the center is the most pronounced. Mm -hmm. The notion of Christ, Jew is the Christ killer, has vanished from Western Europe. It's yeah. a secular yeah. scholar. Yeah. Yeah. It never yeah. exist in Russia anymore, to some yeah. extent in like America, Philippines, and so on. But Poland is still Christ yeah. killer. That is a dominant image. Yeah. When you saw the film, uh, what was it called? The very thing, the nine Gibson, Gibson's Passion. Pardon? Gibson's Passion. The, uh, the one by the French, uh, by Lansman. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, that's the famous scene in which yeah. a surviving Jew comes and the congregation surrounds him and he asks them why would you kill? So somebody comes forward and says, they were killed because they killed Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that is a very important element. And, uh, and the, uh, the Vatican too little footnote in the Bible that the sins of the fathers are not interested in has had no effect at all. It was a little footnote there which which is a dead letter uh, as far as the influence is. Well except for you know some circles such as the, the intelligentsia uh, from Krakow, the, the, uh, the yeah. club of Catholic intelligentsia from Krakow, who who, are, you know, who cried at once, all of them, is a heresy, right? If you say things like this. So they rejected religious answer, but the, this is where uh, Karl Wojtyla was the bishop mm -hmm. before he became the pope, right? And this is where this uh, pope's influence, the, 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 the influence of his teaching is alive. Mm -hmm. Poland is very famous for its cult for the pope, mm -hmm. which doesn't have much to do with, with the admiration of his teaching. Um, it's a country where we've got a very uh, peculiar mixture of Catholicism and nationalism. And that's the overwhelming majority of the uh, population. The, the people in Russia were a very nice women in them. Uh, I enjoyed a lot speaking to them, and they were very open to me. The, 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 the things which they revealed were you know, terrifying. Uh, the, there's another element, perhaps, which you have in Lithuania, very similar to Poland in this respect, the church interests and so on, uh -huh. and the resentment Poles feel. And the belief in the West that they are so anti-Semitic, 
that is the theme. There was a serum I remember in Krakow last year in which one priest, I forget what his name, but a violent attack on the Jews who defamed Poland. And yeah. the Jews as defamers of Poland, yeah. that is the theme. I don't know if you would counter that. Anti Polonism. Uh, 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 yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't keep it. We have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, you were asking why. 10 years between the two studies were so drastic. Isn't it that there's a lot more permission to voice anti-Semitism? No. Yeah. Uh, actually, there is, it's becoming increasingly politically incorrect. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I wonder whether my results are 100% genuine. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. um, at the same time, um, there is this growing awareness that anti-Semitism is Bad. is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Now, the late John Paul II said, it's a sin, you have to go to confession, right? Well, um, what do you confess? Now, um, you know, Catholics are meant to confess deeds, primarily, thoughts, and these are thoughts. Mm -hmm. uh, well, these are light sins, so you don't go to confession with your thoughts. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there is a certain connection between your thoughts and your deeds. Is what Jesus said. Mm -hmm. right. Right. Um, so, now, I have a question unrelated in some ways. But how did Poland react when Hungary elected Nazis to its government this last year? Was there any reaction at all? No, I can answer before. Uh, there was a re reaction among European Union states. Mm -hmm. Poland, I know that Poland actively. Uh, pushed other European um, Union member states to, to do something, to say something about it. Mm -hmm. So this, I would say this was a diplomatic level of reaction. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Why do you want to go with it? Why? Because it's a great country to move. As in June. <laughs> We as you, you we are not the paper you. No, you're not. No, I don't have a uh, written, uh, written version. I'm presentation one version. I can give you the presentation. Yes, I'll give you the presentation.